In the previous lecture, we um, went over an example of how a Turing machine works or runs on uh, a specific input. And now uh, we want to move on and, and actually see how we can use the concept of a Turing machine to uh, define a theory of computation, namely define what it means for a function to be computable, for a set to be decidable, and so on. So we first define what it means for a function f from natural numbers to natural numbers to be Turing computable. So such a function is Turing computable if there exists a Turing machine m such that on input n, and we assume here that on the tape itself n is represented in binary, so on input n, the computation of m halts. Remember, uh, a Turing machine program has a sp uh, specific uh, halting state. So if the on during uh, the computation of m on this input here, m reaches that halting state, then the output, and uh, remember that was the uh, uh, bit sequence of bits uh, immediately to the right of the current cell uh, is f of n. And again, we assume then this is a given in binary. So this means that when I start running the Turing machine m on this configuration, so this tape contents, that is n written in binary on the uh, tape and uh, blanks to the left and to the right of it, and the uh, uh, read right head pointed to the uh, cell immediately to the left of the input. Then the Turing machine starts running. Right, so M runs. And eventually, uh, the Turing machine will reach a configuration that looks like this. So it will um, read an instruction, remember we represented those instructions as uh, quintuples, where uh, the last uh, in the int entry ind indicates which uh, state we should pass into. And now it, M halting means it reaches an instruction where it will actually pass into the uh, halting state, QF. So remember QF, this was the halting state. then by definition, the output would be the string that is on the tape immediately to the right of the current cell. So we read to the right of the current cell till we find the first blank. And that is the output. And in order to compute f, we have to assume that um, or require that this string here represent is the binary representation of f of n. So once we have the notion of a Turing computable function, we can now also define what it means for a set to be decidable or more general for a problem to be decidable. We call a set of natural numbers Turing decidable if its characteristic function, so the function given as chi sub x of n, where the value is 1, if and only if n is in x, otherwise it's 0. Uh, if this function is Turing computable. It should be clear that um, these concepts can be uh, defined also for functions that are um, map strings to strings or strings to natural numbers or natural numbers to strings in a straightforward way and also for sets of strings over some alphabet. Here are a few examples of uh, Turing computable functions. Um, the function f of n equals 2n. It's a simple function that is uh, Turing computable, and it should not be too hard to come up with a, for you to come up with a program that actually does this. 
But uh, more complicated functions can also be shown to be Turing computable. For example, this function f of n that gives us the nth digit in the binary expansion of pi is Turing computable. In the previous lecture, I've tried to convince you that this language is uh, Turing decidable right, by gi giving the idea of a Turing machine that uh, accepts this set of strings here. But also more traditional sets, uh, so to say, uh, can be shown to be Turing decidable. For example, the set of all prime numbers. I mean, you'd, you'd have to put a little bit of effort into actually uh, programming a Turing machine that does it, but it can be done. Similarly here, you'd have to, uh, the program would be much more complicated as a program for this function, but uh, it, as I said, it can be done. So once again, those two functions here are examples of Turing computable functions, while these two sets here are examples of Turing decidable sets. And often the word decidable here is also replaced by computable. So we would also speak of uh, Turing computable sets. So far we have given all our definitions of computability based on Turing machines. But a Turing machine is just a specific uh, model of computation. So it's not clear why Turing machines should serve as the basis of a definition for computability of functions per se. However, it turned out that other notions of computability, so that are based on different models, were equivalent to uh, Turing computability. So here are some of those uh, concepts. There's the lambda calculus introduced by Church. There's the concept of a Re mu recursive or just recursive function that's due to Gödel and Erbon. And then there's uh, register machines uh, that were developed by various authors later on. So those were um, developed around more or less around the same time that Turing proposed his uh, model of a Turing machine. And all allow you to define the notion of a computable function and try to capture the notion of an algorithm formally, and it turned out that all these notions of computability uh, are equivalent and also equivalent to uh, Turing computability. And this uh, formal evidence, so those are really formal equivalences in, in a mathematical sense, led to the formulation of the Church-Turing thesis that says that a function from natural numbers to natural numbers is algorithmically computable, or if you, another way to say it's uh, effectively uh, calculable. So in the intuitive sense, if and only if it is Turing computable. So this is not a mathematically verifiable statement. It's an informal statement because of course here this notion algorithmically computable is an informal statement. So there is no chance to prove the Church-Turing thesis. But there has been overwhelming evidence over the past decade, decades that um, the thesis actually holds. I mean, first by the uh, uh, equivalence of uh, many, many computational models, and you can you can add to this list many other models. I mean, so for instance, everything that you can program by a C++ program, uh, any such function is uh, actually Turing computable and vice versa. But also things like a quantum computer, while they appear to be able to solve or compute many functions more quickly, there's nothing that they uh, could compute in addition to Turing machines in general. So if you're just uh, uh, concerned with computability, but not efficient in the sense of fast computability, then quantum computers won't give you anything new. So these days, the, the Church-Turing thesis is uh, widely accepted. And from now on, we will uh, often drop the term Turing in 
uh, when speaking about computability. So instead of a Turing computable function, we will just say computable function and appeal to the Church Turing thesis. Accepting the thesis also allows us to uh, get rid of the rather tedious work of programming or, or specifying specific Turing machines for a task and just list an informal algorithm that does the job for us and then uh, appeal to the thesis to say, well, then we can find an equivalent Turing machine program. A question you may have uh, by now is, what does a non-computable function actually look like? Is there a non-computable function at all? And we will answer that question in the next lecture. But in order to do that, we need to uh, talk about partial computability. Partial computability arises from uh, the fact that a Turing machine may not halt at all when running on, on some input. Consider, for example, this Turing machine. It has a single instruction, or actually three different instructions. But each of these three instructions is of the same form. Namely, if we are in state zero, we read either zero, one, or blank. We put the same character, leave the character there on the cell, go right, and go to state zero. So this Turing machine, the only thing it will do, it will always read and go right, read, go right, read, go right. And it will do that forever. So it will actually uh, not halt on any input at all. But you could uh, easily imagine a little bit more complicated uh, Turing machine, which actually halts only uh, on in certain cases. So only when it reads a one or, or something in the input. So in the world of uh, modern programming lam languages, this would correspond to entering an infinite loop. And so think of a while loop where the, uh, the um, condition is never satisfied and hence the program never uh, gets out of that loop. This phenomenon gives rise to the notion of a partial computable function. So a partial function uh, is a function that is defined not necessarily on all natural numbers, but only a sub subset thereof. And we say such a function is partial computable if there exists a Turing machine M, such that this Turing machine halts on input N if and only if N is in the domain of F, so X. And if it is in the domain of F, then the machine halts and outputs f of n, so the value of f on that input. If n is not in x, so not in the domain of f, then m will run forever on that input, so it will never halt. Just as we had the notion of a decidable set corresponding to that of a computable function, by just requiring that um, the characteristic function of the set, of a decidable set, is uh, computable. Now we have the notion of a semi-decidable set uh, corresponding to the introduction of a partial computable function. We say that a set Z, a subset of N, is semi-decidable if the function phi sub z that is defined as follows phi sub z of n is 1 if n is in z, but it's undefined if n is not in z. So instead of the characteristic function where we would have a 0 here if n is not in z, we make the function partial by just having it undefined if n is not in z. So the domain of this function would be just the set of all uh, numbers that are in Z. So if the set Z now is called semi-decidable, if this function here is partial computable. So what does that mean? Well, for this function to be partial computable, we need to have a Turing machine M so that 
m halts on input n and outputs 1 in that case if and only if n is in z. So semi-decidable now refers to positively decidable in the sense that when I run m on my input n and if m halts and outputs something then I can be sure that uh, there's number so the input was in the set z. However, if n is not in z, then I will never find out because my machine will run forever. And this, of course, immediately raises the question, can I tell whether a given Turing machine runs forever on, on a certain input? And this uh, is called the halting problem and will be the source of our undecidable problem, which we will introduce in the next lecture. So let me just finish this lecture by saying that uh, semi-decidable is uh, often found uh, under a different name, namely recursively enumerable. And that name comes from the fact that I can indeed, if a set is recursively enumerable or semi-decidable, I can indeed enumerate all positive instance, instances, namely the members of the set, by just running the Turing machine that witnesses the uh, recursive enumerability of the set. By running this machine uh, on one input uh, after another, by a method called uh, dovetailing. And whenever uh, the machine halts on, on an input, I know that this input is in Z, so uh, I have produced another element of Z. So I can, in this way, enumerate, effectively enumerate, all the elements of my set Z. So here's an important example of uh, a semi-decidable set. So suppose we have an enumeration of all polynomials in three variables, so pj of x, y, z, right? So they're uh, with integer coefficients. So it's not hard to see that there are only countably many such polynomials. Uh, and we, we assume we have some enumeration uh, of those polynomials. It's not, not hard to come up with uh, something like that. And then we put z to be the set of all j, such that the jth polynomial, pj, has a solution. So the if we set it to 0, this equation has a solution in the integers. So appealing to the Church-Turing thesis, it's easy to see that this set is uh, recursively enumerable or uh, semi-decidable. Because for j, right, for input j, we just go through all possible combinations, integer combinations of x, y, z um, successively. So we start with 0, 0, 0, test whether that gives us, evaluates to 0. If, if yes, we finish and output 1. If not, we take, te, uh, we take the next combination. Again, there. They, there are only countably many such combinations x, y, z here in the integers, remember. And um, test that. Well, does it evaluate to zero? If yes, we stop, output one. If not, we go on. And now you see, well, if it has a solution in the integers, we will eventually find it. But if it doesn't, then we will go on and search forever for that input. And here again, the question would be, um, whether this set is actually uh, decidable, not just semi-decidable. Uh, and uh, this points to an important mathematical problem, uh, which was uh, known as uh, Hilbert's Tenth Problem. And Hilbert's Tenth Problem is another pr uh, example of a uh, set or problem that is semi-decidable, but not decidable. There was a famous theorem of the 20th century due to Matyasevich and others.